It is such a pleasure to interview Francis Xavier Aloisio, who's welcomed me into his beautiful new home today. Thank you, Francis. You're welcome. You're welcome. Your output of information literally takes my breath away. It's um, almost did, no? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good. <laughs> well, you've written so many books, including The Age of Magic and Wisdom, um, as well as Islands, Islands of, of Dreams. Dream, uh, the New Temple Dreamers, The Age of Magical Wisdom, which we are passing now this time. The Age of Magic and Wisdom, then the handbooks, then Islands of Dreams Speak. It's uh, the collection of people's experience about the temples. Then I put also the tempers through poetry and prose and painting because I started as painter. Then I started writing later on in my life. So you're an artist at heart. And I also want to mention the documentary you've made, yes, hopefully the first of many. Yeah, I hope so. Which is called Let the Stone Speak. Let the Stone, Let the Stone Speak. And it is um, the first documentary to actually make people that don't know anything about the tempers of Malta an introduction to what these temples are about, and especially the connection of the temples to Atlantis. I see. And you're an, an Atlantean expert. It's a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> Atlantean expert, yeah. As well. So quite a lot of uh, tricks in your bag. Somehow that I never started or thought that I would come to this point, because I started painting about the temples, and I knew about the temples as much as anybody else. But then I started to do my own research and was the need to write about the temples. And I read all the books from archaeological, historical, and um, academic perspective. Nothing was there to tell me was the real purpose of, of these sites, of these sacred sites. So I started to do my own research. And that brought me into synchronicity with incredible people that were on a spiritual, metaphysical, and basically they had beautiful insights that they passed it on to me. So I was left with a desktop of information. So my role was basically to put all those that information into some how is a tangible, practical, and down-to-earth information that can be passed on to local people, to normal people. Not to the academic, I'm not writing for the academic, uh, archaeological, or historical perspective, but to local people, to the people that want to know the real purpose of these mysterious sites on Malta and Gozo. And coming now. <laughs> Absolutely. And what magical sites they are. And they Malta are. has called me as well. What is it about the islands that is indeed so magical? That's, I think that's something that I had to go and check and research. You know, what, what is the magical island? Why there are so many temples, you know, 55, 64? On this small island, you have got 64 stone hinges. Some of them are saved, some of them are destroyed, some of them are built on, some of them vanished from the air. But there are still the energies of 64 temples. Now, why would you build 64 magical sites on an island? So the island must have had some vortexes, some energy spots that these beings, these, I call them star beings that landed on, on this mountain tops, recognize and they wanted to actually start a project, a cosmic project. So it wasn't a local group of people. This is a cosmic project. And if you do the experiences of what's going on in our world today and what was going on when they started building the temples, we are passing through a parallel lines, parallel timelines. At the time, humanity was in a crisis after the second flooding of Atlantis. The humanity lost its, its source, lost its connection with source. 
and there was a need of downloading new information. Like you have got a old computer, you need to download a new program. So, so what is what was happened then, and what is happening now? We are passing through a parallel timeline. It, what happened after the second flooding of Atlantis and the third era of Atlantis, and what is happening now? Humanity needed a new download, a new consciousness. And at that time, they had to create a technology to attract, download, anchor, hold, and transmit consciousness. Consciousness is life, is light, is energy, is everything that we have got around us, is consciousness. So they started to create and build the temples. So, so the temples were the anchors, the generators, the transformers, the capacitators of holding this consciousness in their core. So it passes on that energy to Mother Earth. We are passing now to the same process. The difference is huge. The difference is we are being bombarded with this gamma, universal, cosmic consciousness now, but we don't need the temples to do that now. It's us. We are now the walking temples, as I say in the third book, the new temple dreamers, the new walking temples. So our body now are the temples. This is downloading this consciousness in our heart and through us, we are also downloading this consciousness into the core of Mother Earth. So what you're telling me as me, as a human being, I am going through a conscious shift right now. Yes, at, at present, our whole bodies, I'm talking not only the physical body, the mental body, the spiritual body, the astral body, the, uh, the etheric body is changing and pulsating to a new DNA. So at the end of Atlantis, our DNA was 12 strands. So there were 12 capacitators, 12 energy points that we pulsated together. At the end of Atlantis, we lost nine strands and we left with three lower strands just to survive. At this point, it's sort of all the new kids that are being born at this time, they are already pulsating to a higher DNA. We, the older ones, have to, how do you say, reboot, recharge, and re-download this new DNA. So we are passing through a new DNA rebooting. Everybody, consciously, if you know about it, or unconsciously, if you don't know anything about it. We are passing through a new DNA rebooting. So that is going to bring us into the 12 strands to the 13th strand, which means then we are ready to pass on to the fifth dimension vibration. That's incredible. <laughs> so I want to go back and sort of take it step by step. So you're talking about this new DNA rebooting. What do my emotions have to do with that? Everything, you know, sort of emotion is because our life is got continuous change, a continuous motion. And the emotion are the fire that makes us move on. The, the, the emotions are the ones that connects us with, with the past, to bring us in the, in the present, to learn from what we have done so we can plan our future, or that we can create a different future from what we had in the past or what we have now. So everything, the, the emotions are the ones that are going to actually, the motor, the fire, the, that ignition that is going to move us forward. Without emotions, we are being dead, dead. Sort of, there are star beings that are very advanced in, in technology, but
but there's no emotion. So they don't know what, what goes on like this. No, you need to have that fire to actually move you forward. So you're saying I can create through my emotions? You create through your own beingness. You know, you, you create through your mind, you create through your heart, and the emotions is the fire that gives you the action. Okay, so it's like a catalyst. It's a catalyst it, that gives you is the motor, is the, is the petrol, is the battery, is the charger that keeps you going to oh. be able to create. Because you as a human being, we are here to be the mirror image of our creator. So we are naturally creators. What we are learning through our new DNA that we can create our future the way that you want it. We can change everything that we have got in front of us, political, historical, educationally, financially, religiously, whatever, all thing. We can recreate everything the way that you want it now. It's our power to do this. So as an artist, you create paintings. I and don't. I don't create anything. I'm, I'm copying what is created already. So I'm copying from the inner heart. You are copying what already the source, the divine has created in front of me. And I absorb it, ter turned it into my emotion, into my feelings, into my emotion, and let the emotion then express themselves so the painting comes out. Sometimes you start with a blank canvas, put that first line, and the painting takes a life of its own. So you are not doing painting, you are just following the di dictate of this painting that wants to be painted. So you are creating from inside by copying what was already beauty around us. So emotions must have an expression. They have to. They, they are the fire, they are the petrol, they are the, uh, the battery, they are the engine that moves us. What but, happens if we suppress our emotions? Ah, then we have got the problems that we have got in our world. You know, so if you suppress anything that is emotional, that it not, doesn't come out, then it comes out in physical illness. It, it, what the English word is beautiful. There is, there will be a dis-ease. There wouldn't be a movement like the car moving because it has got the right petrol, the right engine, the right thing, and it moves on. Then you will have a non-movement and an unease of movement, and you have a disease. So you have got headaches, stress, stomach pains, back pains, anything that is physically manifested, it comes from suppressed emotions. And basically, sometimes it comes from those emotions that we held back or denied when we were young children. So we need to bring them out, acknowledge them, honoring them, and move on. Because if, if you don't express them, bring them out, they're going to kill you. They're going to eat you up. Because they are, this is powerful feelings, this is powerful emotions, this is pow powerful consciousness, this is powerful energy. You know, like the sexual energy is most, the most powerful energy that you can find in the world. You know, there you are. <laughs> Yes, and it seems like it's all too easy to fall into the trap of escaping our emotions. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, sort of what, what we have got, we, we have got those easy. So we, we drink, we take drugs, we get alienated by media, by films, by television, by political discourse. You know, it's all alienation. It's all not focusing on what we are supposed to be here. And the most important thing, it's basically not allowing us to remember who we are. Because we are creators. We are powerful beings. And all these are distractions to actually, it doesn't allow us to go in to say, I am powerful. 
I am God, creator on earth. I am I'm manifesting the will of God on earth. Because God cannot do it except through us. It seems there's an element of separation in that process. Yes, of course. And what are we separate from if we are continuously seeking escape? We, we are separated. Basically, this last 12,000 years since the fall of, of Atlantis, which in our culture is the fall, is the flood, is the, is the throwing out of the Garden of Eden. What, what we have built in this last 12,000 years, a society, a culture, a civilization of separation. Separation from our core, from who we are. And we separated ourselves into nations, languages, cultures, religions, and so on, because we said we are separated. We are not. We are one. We are coming from the same source, from the same beginning, from the same um, uh, source. I said source again, because we are connected. And basically, also, the tempest is telling us this whole thing, the, that the tempests are connection. We are not separate from the tempest. We are part of the tempest, as the tempests are part of us. The stones, when they build it, the tempest, they build them with limestone, because limestone is holding memory. It's holding memory in its core, in its crystalline structure. So when we connect with the stones, we connect with this memory, with this who, you, who we are. Once we connect with that, then we realize the power that we have got inside us because we are carrying the universe inside us. If I, as an individual, heal myself and my emotional body, can I then impact the collective? What we said is that we are not separate. We are one. We are a holographic one. We are pieces of this huge holographic, but it is one whole, even though it's holographic, it's one whole piece. So everybody is going to impact, not only what I do, even what I think. With my thinking is going to create my reality out there and is going to impact, it's a, it's a ripple effect on the other people. So what I do, is going to affect the collective. It's part and parcel. Both the collective and me are one. But the most important that we focus is the individual. Because you are the most powerful person, the most powerful being that can change the world around us. Is the way I feel also affecting my reality? You feel how you think, how you act. Everything is, comes from basically from who you are, what you believe. So all my belief systems that I had up to now had to be thrown out of the window because all those beliefs are not really true who we are, not what we believe in. So what you believe is important because that makes you. What then you do is your belief comes out to be expressed in action. Through the mind, you create. Through the heart, you, you create. Once it's, you create something, it's going to have an effect on the collective, on the people around you. You don't have to do anything. If you are a lighthouse, the, the lighthouse doesn't do anything. It doesn't jump to save uh, shipwrecks. It said, I am here, the light. I give you the light. I give you advice. This is the harbor. But it doesn't do anything. It just gives light. So our role now is to be the lighthouse. Where we go, we transmit the light. What happens when I have a negative feeling? Is there any value in that feeling? Is it telling me something? That's an interesting question. A negative feeling. It's because we are living in a world of polarity up to now. So once, once we go into fifth dimension and beyond, these things we are not going to have polarity or um, different opinion, masculine and feminine, polarities of thinking, polarities of actions, we, that will be over. So the negative feelings are 
also part and parcel of the light and shadow. The light is part of you as also the, the shadow. You have to actually embrace both of them. So see what the negative feelings, where it comes from. Does it come from your inner core? It comes from a reaction from outside, from something that is reacting from outside, but from the past? And look at it. That is there to give you an experience, so you learn from it. So negative is a negative way of saying, because it's an experience that is going to teach you something. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing from you is integration is the key. In integration and bringing everything into that wholeness, that integrate everything as one. Because we, I am one. As I am one, I am one with other people around us, with you, with all the collective around us. So the more that we integrate with love and compassion, this is the problems that we have got in the world at present, that people don't integrate where they are because they keep themselves separate. The more that we integrate and become one, they become more powerful. And we can change anything in, in the world. I look at defining or perhaps redefining the word sentient. Yeah, the sentient. Sentient for me is pulsating to the beat of the universe. So sentient is when you are attuned with what's going on in the universe. We are sentient beings because we carry the universe in our beingness, in our heart. I suppose the heart is the center where that sentientness that's a new word now. I like it. <laughs> that sentientness is, is based in, in our heart. Once we pulsate to the beat of the universe, it, it, we, we can do anything. We can do whatever we want to do. So we are sentient because we have got that universe beat in our heart. Unfortunately, we forgot that. For this last 12,000 years after the fall of Atlantis, we forgot who we are. And we forgot that we are sentient beings. As, as I said before, we are now passing through a rebooting of our DNA. And we are starting to remember, as the aboriginals say, the spirit that we are going through is the great awakening the great remembering. We have been 12,000 years is basically in a dreamland, not a life, not awake, but in a dreamland. Now we are remembering and we are awakening. And basically what we are doing now, we are starting to realize that we are sentient beings because we are carrying the universe in our heart. That's very interesting. You defined it that way. I talked to an astrophysicist from Harvard who also says sentience is resonating with the rest of the cosmos. Wow. And he has the quantum physics to, to back it up. So I really I like I'm just a painter and an author, no quantum <laughs> physics. <laughs> well, that brings me to the, the idea of synchronicity. How does that fit in with our emotions? As we are sentient beings, we are also electromagnetics because we, we function on electricity and magnets. So we, how I say, we give up electricity and attract to us electricity, life, life force. So when we are, how I say, functioning from that sentient beingness in our core, in our heart, we are going to attract what we need at that, at that moment. So even in, our, in my paintings, in my writing, I learned this process of synchronicity because what I needed as I was going into that hard emotional base, I started to attract the right people, the right occasions, the, the right opportunity, the right information to myself. I didn't go and search it, it almost came to me. 
because I was electromagnetically attracting it. I was sending it out as I was attracting it. So it, it, it works together. We have to, because once we are working in our fullness, then we electrify and magnify. So through our sentience, we transmit and receive. receive because we are electromagnetic beings in a multidimensional cosmos. So we have to have this motion of yin and yang. We give and we attract into multidimensional being. We are not only this solar system. We are multidimensional, not only multi-cosmic, dimensional, I'm talking. It's huge. It's massive, and it it's can massive. be hard to get your head around. It is, but it, but it doesn't have to go into a PhD situation. <laughs> Just be yourself. Go to your source. Learn who you are. So is sentience then the gateway to super consciousness? Wow, that's another big word, super consciousness. I don't think that there is a super consciousness, there is consciousness. We, we give all these words, you know, subconscious, unconscious, and so on. There is consciousness. It's us that we are living in the third dimension have to give these consciousness levels, degrees, super, and un, it's some consciousness. Once you are conscious, which means not conscious that I know, once you are conscious is con connecting, that's a difficult question, connecting with your essence. Essence is the beingness of who we are, where we came from. So we came from spirit from the cosmos and we landed on this ho on on this planet earth and we have to download that consciousness to actually be able to actually function in this world so that's what they did with the temples the temples they downloaded consciousness in the core of the planet earth as i said today the role of the temples is over it's us we human beings are downloading, anchoring, and expressing consciousness in the world. Then we have got Christ consciousness. That is a level now, again, a seven dimension, nine dimension level of consciousness. We are there, coming to that point now. Brilliant. I can't wait to see what happens <laughs> next. So intentional living, is that living from the heart? Intentionally living. Yeah. Uh, Where did I you guess, get there? well, to rephrase the question, maybe um, a phrase that you remind me of that I use is intentional living, meaning I live by setting my intentions based on what my heart wants. So, mm. how would you define living from the heart? Intention. We, we used to, in the olden times, we used to um, talk a, a lot about intent, intention. Now it's more beingness, you know, sort of basically you have to learn to actually express everything that we do from the heart is because that's what we say as a human being is basically what we do, we do it with love. With love is the most powerful um, essence that we have got in our hands. Now, then love has to be has to be associated with the heart. We, we, we have got three hearts. We have got the physical heart, we have got the sacred heart, which the Catholic Church used then through the sacred heart of Jesus, and the cosmic heart. So if we unite these threefold flames of the heart, it's a powerful thing that we are going through. So the heart is responding to the sacred heart, to the cosmic heart, and is going to show it through love. So everything that we do is doing it with love. Even what we think, if what we say, sort of one of the things that we are learning not to do is to judge, because judge stop us from acting through love. So we don't judge and we don't enter into discourse with people to argue 
I am right and I am wrong. That's over, done with. We are one, we are one entity, so everything that we do is true love. The love gives us also the electromagnetic that we attract to ourselves what we need. And you've just made me think of um, creating a coherent state in my field by living through the heart and living in intent and using intent, I suppose, with so, love. So, so what are you um, basically? What are you creating? Is an energy field. So that energy field is your aura, your vibrational, your frequency, and basically you put an intention that you only attract and only the people that vibrate to my frequency come into that energy field. Anybody else don't even come near. So I create a different world to what I can see outside because I am creating an energy field that vibrates at a fifth dimension or beyond. You are creating that energy field through love. If enough of us create that energy field, will the whole planet then be a match to 5D and above? Imagine that. But it starts with one stone to move the ripple. So it starts with you. It starts with each one of us, which will have an effect. You say, but me, an effect? We are one. So we are going to have an effect on the collective as the collective is going to affect us. But we are the ones that are going to move that ripple. Do you believe mass meditations and um, events that get groups into a more coherent state mm -hmm. can also affect the collective? Do you remember the film Avatar when, when they got together around the tree of life, you know, and the sound and the rhythm and the um, vibration that they created through movement and sound and how they wanted to create a world, an energy field around them that was totally different through the destructive field outside there. Of course, mass meditation is you're now entering into a web. Even the person that invented the internet called it a world wild web. As there is a world wide web electronically, so there is a world wide web etherically, mentally. So we can connect etherically with the world wide web. And it is as powerful as the internet and the world wide web. And instant, so I'm and hearing. Instant, and it is, uh, again, you don't have to have a Wi Fi. Okay? So telepathy, psychic intuition. These are norms. These are normal for the young people that are being born today because of the 12 strands of the DNA and so forth. And during Atlantis time, when they had these abilities, they didn't need a mobile to connect with somebody. Telepathy was their way of connecting. These are coming back. What I say in the third book, the age of you know, the new temple dreamers, that you that the kids will use less internet, less technology. And the kids say less technology in the future? Yes, because you will start to regain the abilities that you had. That makes sense, and I hope we see that day <laughs> <laughs> soon. Um, so I wanted to ask you about one more question about feeling, and then I want to move into Malta's role in, in the uh, field of Earth, so to speak. Uh, but really, just to cap it all off, is feeling healing? Feeling and healing. Um, from what I understand now, there is no more healing. What we are doing is, because healing is as if something was, was wrong. There is nothing wrong. What we are doing is restore, re, re, restoring, repairing. Sort of, I had a car, I needed to do something, so I take the mechanic to repair it. Nothing wrong with the car, it just needs repairing and restore it 
to its original function. Healing as if something was so wrong that I need to, to rechange everything. So what we are doing is repairing what we are doing, what we have been doing through emotions, through bringing these issues out, through facing them, through saying thank you for being there, but now over, done with, restore the car, the computer to its original thing, and voila, we, don't, we are full, again, whole. Yes, the holistic solution. It's holistic solution. That's why we call it holistic solution. There's holistic therapy. What, what is holistic therapy? We, what we need is to bring our bodies, the bodies. There is the emotional, the mental, the spiritual, the physical. All these bodies to be whole again. What we had in, in between is disease, disease of information, disease of energies. Now it's time that we restore that to its original template. I love that you put it that way because it takes the judgment out of the current state yes. of the collective. Yes, yes, yes. It's yes, a repair. Yes. We're yes. correcting. Yes. And it will just change our course. Yes. It's, it's like having something, a computer having a problem. You, you change and you put it right. That there was nothing wrong with the computer, with the, with the programming, with your car. It just... You put it there, just put it right. You take it to the mechanic, and it's done. Yeah. <laughs> and you just talked about bodies, the physical body, etc. One of the yogic bodies that is recognized is the subtle body, and that is our more intuitive senses. Yeah. Do you think that's imperative that we uh, embrace that subtle body sense to go forward in a shift in consciousness? Yeah. It's not to embrace it, to actually rec recognize it, because it's us, it's me. You know, sort of, uh, these bodies are only... Uh, now we are started talking about the mental body, the spiritual body, the etheric body, the astral body, um, and the physical body. Sort of, uh, even the health system or the health services which it's not health, it's a disease services that we have. But the health services, they split this body and the whole thing. They don't recognize the subtle energies, which is the mental, the etheric, the spiritual, and the, uh, and, and the physical body. What we have got, they treat the physical body without looking at the emotional body or the mental body. Anything that happens here, if it's not dealt with mentally, physically, etherically, spiritually, it will manifest in our physical body eventually. So we have to not embrace it, but acknowledge it because this is us. This is part of us. Absolutely. Do you use your subtle body in, to get the information? I use the dream body. I use the... I have got two selves. I have got the physical self that I decided to come on, on Earth to manifest myself here on this third realm, third dimension realm. And I have got my higher self that stayed over the other side of the veil. But that's part of me. There is here. It's, it's, it's here. So I am, I am divide, I divided myself in two when I decided to, to incarnate. So I, I got the physical self and the higher self. We will call it the higher self. They are not higher self, it's, he is the same self. So he is the one that gives me advice, talks to me in, in my ears, send me dreams, you know, talks to me and gives me information during my sleep. So I wake up in the morning and I have got a picture that I want to paint or I have got a chapter that I need to, to, to read and to write. It's during the night. So I'm in touch. I talk to higher self continuously because he wants my best to be expressed in this third dimension. So he's always there. Give me that support. Beautifully put. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and in terms of Malta's role. Malta. Yes, where is Malta? Where is Malta? <laughs> tell us about Malta. Wow, tell us about Malta. Well, I was born here on this 
rock in the center of the Mediterranean. It, there are three islands, Malta, Gozo, and Comino, exactly in the center of the Mediterranean, between Gibraltar and Palestine, again, Lebanon, and between Italy and Libya, in the center. Malta attracted everybody that was anybody in the world of history, culture, civilization, empires, everybody landed on this land. Before the land was islands, Malta was in the center of the land because this is called Mediterra, Mediterranean sea later on. But before the sea came into the basin, it was mountain tops. And Malta was in the center of the land. That's why it's called Mediterra. And these three mountain tops were in the center of this hub. So it was in the fulcrum of what was there. And that's why Malta then was attracted by the star beings that landed here to start the project of building the temples. You liken Malta to the solar plexus of the planet. Okay, yes, I said the, the solar plexus. There are two solar plexus in the world. The northern hemisphere is Malta. So solar plexus and the pancreas. And the air, uh, the air core, no, the um, Australian uh, rock, Earth rock, Earth rock in Australia is the southern hemisphere solar plexus. So the Earth rock in Australia is the southern hemisphere, Malta is the, the northern hemisphere, which is the emotional thinking. So Malta is the emotional creator of the creator. Malta is the, is the emotional motor that keeps things going. Everything that we have got that starts before entering into the heart and into the mind, it comes from what the English call that gut feeling. The first feeling that you have is boom, that gut feeling. You feel it here and you know it. And Malta is that. But also, it's also the solar plexus and the pancreas, which means it assimilates, takes on all the rubbish, all the thinking, all the problems of the world around it, churn them into this solar plexus. And what it does, the pancreas, it creates life again out of rubbish. So it's an incinerator, then burns it, and then creates life. So what is it? it was an important part in the pulse of the earth, which is still today, doing the same thing um, through the process of, look of what we take, you know, we're taking what's going on in Libya, we're going on in Morocco, we're going on in Egypt, Israel, we're going in Greece, we're going in Italy. Malta is in the center, assimilate all these negative energies, turns them into the solar plexus, into its pancreas, and creates life. That's a big job for a small island. It is. It's a, it's a small island with a big heart, I tell you. Although solar plexus, <laughs> not the heart. <laughs> I get it. Is that why it has uh, more sacred sites than anywhere else in the world per capita? Per capita for, for the amount of uh, square miles that we have got here. It's incredible how many temple sites there are. And which comes to the question why they have so many on this campus. That's, that was my, my research that I went to actually express in my books and the purpose of all, all these things. The, the, the Malta was picked because of the center point, Mediterranean, because of its energy vortex, strong, powerful, strong ley lines. One, one day I will show you the ley line map of Malta, which I send you and so on. It's incredible ley lines that pass through these islands. 
um, Camino has got its own powerful energies, although the smallest island is the most powerful, because Camino is, has got the impulse, was infused with wisdom and enlightenment. Malta was infused with power. And you could feel it. Malta is all power, confusion, building uh, noise. You go to Gozo, you come to Gozo here, it's love and joy. And the countryside and the people and the atmosphere is there. Then you have got Comino, wisdom and enlightenment. The two, power on its own, is destructive. Love and joy are not going to create anything. Comino is the wisdom and enlightenment to bring these two in balance so it can create with love. And as above, so below, right? So we so are below. microcosms of that macrocosm. As above, so below, so, so in the center. So in terms of the ley lines and where Malta is on Earth's grid, can that be correlated to the acupuncture points um, or the meridians? which are used in acupuncture or acupressure That's on the human good. body? How yeah. does that yes. interface? You're right. You know, sort of you have got, um, if, you, if you have, if one day we can do a map of a flat earth of all the sacred sites on earth, you start to realize that is, these are the meridian points. As there are the meridians, there are also chakras. So you have got the main chakras, and then you have got the meridian points, so what, what the Chinese call the meridian points. So you have got main structures, main sites as a chakra sites, and then you have got minor sites, which are the meridians. But they are as important as the chakras, the meridians. Because then, through the meridians, there is the flow. When you, you go to a, Ch a Chinese acupuncturist, he deals with one meridian, and you feel that energy passing through your body, even up to your toes. Because now it passes through the ley lines. So the ley lines are, are highways of energy that is pulsating around the earth. And, and both ley lines are generally like our cartridges, are moving electromagnetic, yin and yang, masculine and feminine, because there is a flow and there is a movement. So all around the earth, we have got these meridians and these chakras. In Malta, in such a small place, they are all concentrated in one small place. So this is huge here. That pulsating vortexes, meridians, and ley lines. And you have got then huge temple structures that are holding those meridians. And that would suggest to me that Earth is sentient. Of course, then. But, but sentient is like now, now it's coming into our, in our discussion. Because if you look at what we have done up to now to Mother Earth, is because we don't see that the animals, that the trees, that the tr stones are sentient. So we went and cut and destruct. And, and what we are coming now, we have got a generation of young humans that are started to protect, protest and protect the earth. Because we are starting to realize that everything that we have got around us from the innate stone, to the rock, to the under ants, to the elementals, they are all sentient. They have got a purpose and they have got a consciousness, what we call the consciousness, because they are alive. Once they are alive, they have got sentient. Do they have a soul that goes to heaven and earth? Not even us, we don't go to heaven and earth. We have got consciousness, a soul that keeps us going. So also these sentient beings, the trees, the animals, the stones, the sea, the fish, and we can communicate with them. And the sacred sites of Malta are also sentient? Of course. Sort of one of the, one of the leading archaeologists, uh, Sir Temizal Zamit, when they used to ask him questions that he couldn't answer, 
Uh, what about this temple site and so on? What, what is the, uh, how long, how old, how, what, how? He used to say, let the stones speak. Listen to the stones. Because they are holding the story. They are, they can tell us. Once you then connect in silence, in meditation, in quietness, in like in the hypogeum, in the womb of the earth, you'll get the story. Their story, not the story that we impose on them. You know? I know. So you're taking me to some sacred sites in Gozo today. We're going to Gigantia first. Gigantia, we might go to the Alam and here. We see we have time to go to, to Taverna. So you see a big site and the abandoned site. And then to an open space called Tachench. Where at Tachench, these star beings that landed on water came from Sirius. So they set up a communication center to keep connected with Sirius. So it's, this is the center that connects um, the islands with Sirius, but also is a multi-dimensional, multi, multi-beings multi conference center. They get together to discuss cosmos issues. This is huge, huh? That's massive. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> wow, and I can't wait to see it. Um, uh, Gigantia, what is its primary function? Okay, Gigantia, which in, Malta, I mean, in Maltese means giant, giant gigant. In, in Maltese, we have got two Gs, one soft G and one harsh G. And Gigantia has got the twos, the first two Gs. So it's gig, gigantia. It's a huge tower. It's a, a, the tower of the goddess. When the star beings landed, the first um, center that they built, the first site that they built was Korba. Skorba is at Mjar on Malta. But the first site that they finished was um, gigantia. And gigantia, is is huge is massive the stones are they speak to themselves and it is the mind chamber as the hypogeum is the creative chamber connecting with mother earth where the sleeping goddess on the right hand side like buddha connects with the mother earth to give you ideas what to create so what we are doing now is we create through our thinking. What we comes to our mind, we can create. But it was Gigantia, the mind chamber, that gave them the form, the idea, what to create, how to create it, more than to So Gigantia was also where the Queen of Atlantis used to go to connect with the beyond, because these people, like what we do, we have either Skype or mobile to connect with our family in England or our family in the United States. These people may had connection through these temples to connect with their home, where they came from. So Jkantia is powerful. It had, it's, there's so much in, in, in my handbook. I say so much about Jkantia because they had, permanent fire, they had free energy, they had, it, it was a healing spa where they could regenerate their cells because they knew that every now and then our cells die and we need to regenerate. It was a health spa where they always held balance between their physical bodies and etheric bodies. So they went there to connect and to regenerate themselves. And the, how is it, the representative of Jugantia, the image that has got in the main temple, is the serpent. And the serpent is the, it represents the regeneration. It sheds its own skin and creates a new one without losing its beingness. Just shed its own skin. In visiting these sites, am I activating the sites? Or are they activating me? 
How does that to work? To doing both. One of the things that I started to do years ago, and I had to learn the process, and there's a protocol, is these were like a computer that hasn't been used for 12,000 years. So the, the temples were dormant for, for 12,000 years. It doesn't mean dormant that they lost the memory. What it means, that you have to plug them in and reboot them and recharge them. So I had to do that with all the temples. My role, I was sent to do this, to connect with the temples, say thank you to the guides and the guardians that protected these sites for these thousands of years, and then reboot them, recharge them so they can start to be activated. And we started to realize that there is geometry, sacred geometry coming. Once they started to, to wake up in a way, the awake, awakening, start to show us a sacred geometry in them. So I had to do that. So today the temples are all charged or rebooted or active. And anybody that goes in, walks in, is going to be charged with, with that energy. So what you do, you connect with the temples. The temples now the role is to pass it on to you. And you take it in your heart to wherever you're going, to the United States, to, to England, and you take it there. So the, the temples are passing on their knowledge, their wisdom, and their energies to you. Beautiful. Today. Beautiful. You talked about sacred geometry. One of the um, aspects I'm, I find really interesting is the Fibonacci sequence and how it appears everywhere in nature. So does it also appear of in course, the of making course. of the temples? In the there are some people that are working on uh, sacred geometry. I, I, I have got, we have got our own sacred geometry through Christine's sacred cards, which we, which we produce and now we are going to put it also as evil. Because every vibration, as we know, when you do the Hertz experiment, you put a sheet and you put some powder and you put Hertz, it creates a sacred geometry. The temples are creating sacred geometry because each temple is vibrating to its own Hertz. So it's moving fast or low. That fastness or low vibration creates a sacred geometry. So every temple has got its own sacred geometry, it's got color, and its own tone. Marvelous, no? It is marvelous. <laughs> and you can feel it. I've already visited quite a few. Um, and it's really evident in, yes. in um, for me, I can detect it straight. And as you enter and you discard anything that you know about the temples, anything that somebody told you or read and so on, the best thing is to enter there with the heart open and let the temples, let the stones speak to you. Then you, it's your own experience, it's not somebody else. Do you think that science is catching up with spirituality? Oh, yes, very much so. I think we are starting to come to that point of realizing that science and spirituality and God are, are one thing. You know, God, I'm saying God is the source, is the creator. It's what the, the prime creator is coming up. It's like science fiction and science. Science is catching up with science fiction. No. What science fiction was 300 years ago with Julius Verne and all the other people that wrote about science fiction, and everybody thought that they are mad. The first men on the moon around the world in 80 days, you know, a thousand feet under the sea. Today it's fact. They are not anymore fiction or science fiction. And, and anybody that wrote or read the science fiction realizing that everything that NASA is saying today or scientists, it's fact. And I think this is happening also in our, how you say, spiritual metaphysical explanation of the temples. Because the temples up to now, we have been, they have been explained from a historical, archaeological and academic point of view. We haven't entered into the science or the metaphysical of these things, but we have to, 
because without that, we cannot understand what they stand for. And that was my role to do that, to try to say that the temples are not only physical, they are not only stones or shape, they are something else, there is consciousness, there is a frequency, a vibration that science has to come to terms and realize and marry them and bring them together. Marry them together. There it yes. is. I love it. And I'm trying to do the same thing with emotions. Of course. And emotional intelligence. So yeah. do the sites have a certain emotion? Does each site, because it, each site vibrates at a different frequency? Yes, yeah, so we, we can say that each site has got an emotion. If you separate that word, they have got E and emotion. So it's almost everything that we say today is uh, E and, uh, and put sort of the computer, you know, in electronics and so forth. Today we have got everything is in motion, everything vibrates, everything moves. So everything is in motion, which that motion creates emotion. So everything is emotion, al, emotional. So emotion, which comes from motion. Because everything is vibrates, it moves, it's changing continuously. So everything is the same word. They use them, they use the word in different ways, but it's the same. Yeah. Okay. And does that have a sacred geometry to it? Everything, everything. Because everything does. Everything is vibrate. Once you have got, it's like music. You know, music, you know, if you look at the, the music of the spheres, what he's talking, music of sacred geometry, because everything in the world, everything that vibrates, that has got a consciousness, it has got a sacred geometry, it has got a sacred color, it has got a sacred symbol, everything. So even you, if you, if you look at yourself and you take a picture of your aura, it will give you a picture that you don't see, you are a mass of colors that you can see. It depends how you are at that present emotionally, moving or not moving, that aura changes. So it's never fixed. If you're feeling low, down, angry, uh, judgmental, the aura is going to change different colors. If you are or more on a higher spirit, it comes more purple, violet, white, yellow. The more that you go down, the more it's going to show the lower colors. Yes, and lower would be chaos. Brown. In the field. Yes. Yes. In the field. So in terms of the geometrical patterns, they show up or are more coherent in the higher emotional states. That's, that's true. It's sort of it's like in Danian painting. When, when you have got the spectrum that you use, the color that you use, if you, at one point, you cannot get it right and you get angry and you mix those colors, it becomes brown. I have Ugly done that brown. before. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone. Ah, it's good. Oh, yes. Um, okay. Uh, you referred to source. And I wonder how source relates to sentience. As I said, we are sentient beings because we are holding the universe in our heart, in our core, which is the source, which means the creator. So we are holding in our core the manifestation, the incarnation, the expression of source in a third dimension reality. In other dimension, it will be different. But here, we can do it this way, through manifesting what we create outside of ourselves. This comes from our source, from, from that creative, sentient source that we are holding the universe in our heart. Beautiful. And I'm wondering what the language of the light is. Is it, does, the oh, universe yes. speak in terms of emotion? The language of the light is what we are talking, is the color, is sacred geometry, is sound. 
these people that built these temples knew about these things and they could heal themselves, could, that could lower, lower or raise their vibration through sound because sound then lifts you. So if we, if we are playing the right music at the, at the right hertz of three, what? Three, three, four, twenty, whatever it is. The no? four, three, two. The, the four, three, two. The coherent. Yes, the four, three, two. Then it gives us a lifting experience. If we go to beyond to the other type of music, the rock music and so on, which is not according to this vibration, then we feel angry, uh, aggressive, uh, awful, discordant, and so forth. So it's up to us to actually know what suits us to raise our vibration. Everything, you know, the environment, the countryside, the trees, the colors, the clothes that we wear, everything can lift us to, to a vibration. Because everybody has got a vibration to help us to do that. And that's how I think of emotions, because I sort of see them as a biochemical feedback system that are showing me my vibration all the time in relation to this thing or that thing or yeah. that over there. Um, do you think that our sentience is actually like a sort of a GPS? A GPS. My wife, Christine, does quantum, quantum infinity, which is basically it's through an application that enters into the auric field, into your auric field. So it connects to your auric field, and this application sees, she can see what's going on in your aura, from your chakra, from your organs, from your, from your mental state, from your emotional, everything. So it's because it's sentient. Because it's sentient, it's connect with your auric field. As this laptop and this application is sentient, because it's connecting with something that is alive. And it takes it in and shows what needs to be dealt with, what repair it needs to be done. So it is. It's part and parcel of the whole thing, you know? Beautiful. <laughs> uh, I've so enjoyed speaking to you, and I love reading your books, and I've also read them to my children. Wow. And I think you're a genius for making this material relatable to all ages. Thank you. Thank so you. So well done to you. Thank you. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to the conversation? Oh, no, I'm going to have a, a drink now and, uh, <laughs> and have a rest. I picked your brain, uh, yeah, quite a lot today. So I really appreciate your time and your You're effort. welcome. Thank you it so much. It was a pleasure and it was an honor. Likewise. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.